The Carnegie Mellon Quarantine Database Talks are made possible by the Stephen Moy Foundation for Keeping It Real and by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. All right, the pandemic rages on, so let's talk about databases. Uh, we're super happy to have Marcus Pillman uh, today from, from Snowflake to talk about Family HMDB. Uh, Marcus joined Snowflake in, in 2016. Prior to that, he got his PhD from ETH Zurich, honor Donald Coastman, who Donald now runs all of MSR. Uh, so, you know, it's, that's awesome. Databases go everywhere. Um, he recently moved to South Dakota with his wife. So he's living on a, in a large plot of land that's not really a farm, but that happened before the IPO. So this is something that he's been planning for a while. Um, so again, the way we'll do this is that if you have any questions for Marcus, please unmute yourself uh, and say who you are and where you're coming from and ask your question and feel free to interrupt any time anytime during the talk. We want this to be interactive. And of course, as always, we wanna thank the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real for sponsoring this event. All right, Marcus, the floor is yours, go for it. Thank you, Andy, thanks for the introduction. Hi, everyone. So I worked on, on, on distributed systems for a relatively long time for my age at least. So um, I, I did research in like distributed key value stores uh, and then I joined Snowflake. And I wanna talk a bit about that, but more specifically, I wanna talk about um, testing a distributed database or more in general, like testing distributed systems in general. Um, I think like those of you who ever had the, had the privilege to do that know that testing a distributed system is probably a better experience than sticking a fork into your eye, but not by a whole lot, right? It's, 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 it's pretty miserable and it's a, it's a difficult problem. Um, <clears throat> but before I go there, I wanna give some amount of context here. So first I wanna say a few words about FoundationDB, then I wanna say a few words about FoundationDB with in Snowflake, um, and, and then we go into, into the dirty stuff. So FoundationDB is, for those of you who didn't heard of it, uh, hear of it yet, is a distributed key value store which provides very strong transactional guarantees. Um, so it is strictly serializable across its whole key space. Um, um, and strictly here means that we also guarantee for causal reads, which means that if you, 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 you write something and then someone else, after your commit, someone else reads that thing, they are guaranteed to see your write immediately after you have uh, committed it. Um, <clears throat> and that is not something that only serializable systems have to provide. If you look at the definition of what serializable means, you are allowed to reorder stuff. And so like old reads is something that, that, that would be okay. The way FoundationDB achieves that, and I won't go too much into details. <clears throat> um, there's, there's an excellent talk on, on uh, YouTube from Evan Johnen, um, who, who explains the whole architecture. So if you're interested in that, I would invite you to look at that. But it, it does a mix of optimistic concurrency control and snapshot isolation. And the way to think about it is a database is has a state and whenever you commit a transaction, you bring it into a new state, right? Uh, so you can think of it as a kind of a queue or a log uh, and you read at certain points in that log. And <clears throat> when we start a transaction, I think I can get a pointer. You basically just figure out what's the current head of, uh, what's the current state, right? And you, 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 you stop time here and whenever you read from the database, you only read from this state and you never read anything from afterwards. And that's the snapshot isolation part. So you take a snapshot of the database. But obviously we cannot stop the world while right? you are running your transaction. So all the transactions will commit and they will therefore roll forward the state. And eventually you wanna commit, so you try to write your own state. So this will give you a write version, right? Uh, I mean, that's kind of foundation DB calls that read version, write version. And 
everything that happened in between here is now your conflict zone. So if you can verify that nothing in here will um, violate any consistency guarantees, then you can write. Otherwise, it will abort your transaction. And the simple way of doing, like one simple way of doing that, is you make sure that everything you have read during your transaction, like nothing that you have read was written in here. So you basically just have a bunch of key ranges that you have read through through your, while your transaction was running. And you check whether anything in here writes into one of your key regions. And if that's not the case, then you can commit. Otherwise, you can abort, which is a bit different from traditional snapshot isolation where you check for right write conflicts. But then you get into these write skew issues, et cetera. And then and Foundation DB doesn't have them. Um, so, what do we use that for? Like, Snowflake doesn't provide an OLTP like kind of transactional database. Um, if you look at the Snowflake paper or some of your blog posts, you will see a picture like that, that, that presents the whole Snowflake architecture. And the way to think about this is <clears throat> when you as a customer write a query, right, it will go into this cloud services layer. That's what we call this, which uh, um, has stuff like the SQL compiler, it, it, it infrastructure manager, it does some security, it provides a web GUI endpoints for OLTP, uh, for ODBC and JDBC drivers, uh, all, all these good things that you need. Um, <clears throat> and, and then you have your warehouses, which is basically just clusters of machines, and they execute these queries. So the SQL compiler will generate an execution plan, and then one of these clusters will execute this execution plan, and it will read and write data from the storage. And the storage in Snowflake's case is uh, Amazon S3 or Azure Blob Storage, or depending on which uh, cloud provider you're running on. But this layer above needs to um, be able to store metadata. And we want to access this metadata in a low latency kind of way. And this is where our foundation DB is sitting. And the way we typically say this is the SQL compiler here, that's the brains, the virtual, because it, it, it implements most of the logic, the, the virtual warehouses or the execution platform is the muscles, right? Because they execute the hard work. And, and Foundation DB is kind of the heart, keeping it all together. And <clears throat> so that means everything that needs an, uh, an, an, a transactional workload for everything, the, for all these kind of things, we use Foundation DB. So that includes metadata, stuff like username, password hashes, and the results. Uh, security groups, encryption keys, query history, uh, schema definition. Uh, but then it, uh, we also use it to all our transactions. Remember that Amazon S3 doesn't give you any transactions. It's an eventual consistent storage. So you need to implement them on top of them. And, <clears throat> the, and, and, and Snowflake implements some form of snapshot isolation. And so it uses Lambert clocks. Um, and it stores file locations. I will go into that slightly. Um, but then also think of a Snowflake region as a, like a huge distributed systems with uh, thousands of machines running all the time. So we need to maintain machine topology. We need to decide who is alive and who is dead and all these kind of things. And, and uh, we need to do service discovery. And for all those things, we use Foundation DB. Um, so one example, very quick, and this is simplified to a point that it's not really correct anymore, but it should give you an intuition of how Snowflake works. So our customer data is written into files on Amazon S3, and it's written in a, in a columnar format. So we use something like a PEX layout. And <clears throat> In order to figure out where your data is, we have some metadata in Foundation DB, 
and and this metadata will point you to to your data. So now, if you want to read something, you first go to Foundation DB and ask where are my files, and then you will get a list of of pointers. Basically, and now you can fetch your data from S3. If you want to update. Uh, we do a copy and write. So in the first step, you will rewrite the whole file. This is also one reason, like if you do single point updates in Snowflake, it probably won't be super fast. Um, we will rewrite the whole file. So that's maybe 16 megabytes in size. Um, and nobody will be able to read that because you see there's no pointer from FoundationDB to this thing. Um, and, and, and the reason here is S3 has some weird consistency guarantees. I, I, like basically if you, if you read something for the first time and it was only created but never updated, then you're guaranteed to read the most recent state. However, if you pull and you read something that doesn't exist and someone else creates it, um, you will not be guaranteed to see that immediately, right? So because then you have like caching going on and these kind of things. So so we write this file and now if the transaction fails, then nothing bad happens. We waste some space, we can like clean it up later. But then at commit time, we can atomically move this pointer to the new state. And this is probably the most simplified version of how does uh, Snowflake work. But <clears throat> this should give you an idea of how important foundation DB is to this whole architecture. Right? It is uh, one of the most critical pieces here because if foundation DB ever becomes unavailable, we cannot process any queries. In fact, users cannot even log into the web GUI, like nothing works anymore. If we lose data, which has never happened so far, um, fingers crossed, then we will lose customer data. Like, because encryption keys in, are in there, we will, nobody will be ever able to read that data anymore. Like, obviously, we still have backup systems, et cetera, in place. Um, <clears throat> but that would be like really bad if we would corrupt the Foundation DB database. And it would, it, it would make many people unhappy. And, and to give you an idea how critical that is, we had. Um, incidences where, for example, farmers in Minnesota were not able to repair their tractors anymore because the system for like ordering replacement parts relied on some Snowflake database somewhere. So if it goes down, then they, they cannot order any replacement parts. Um, so these databases are like important pieces, like important for many companies, not only for us. Presumably you're running one, one foundation, foundation DB cluster per customer, right? No. For, for the entire fleet, you're running a single cluster. For a deployment. Um, and in most cases, each region will have one deployment. Our larger regions will have more than one deployment. So, and then within one deployment, there's multiple customers. No, there's one. Uh, okay, so, yeah, so a customer has multiple deployments and then within an deployment you have a single foundation DB. No, no, it's a multi-tenant thingy, right? So think of, for example, Snowflake uh, Switzerland. I have to take this as an example as a Swiss person, right? So Snowflake yeah. Switzerland has exactly one FDB cluster running. Okay, that makes sense. Or, okay, you can and yeah. all customers will use that together. Got it. Okay, perfect. Keep going. Yeah. Good. Um, okay, so that means we have to test this properly. Um, now, I like this quote from Dijkstra. Uh, Dijkstra was not a big fan of testing in general. He, he, he believed that you have to verify that your stuff is correct, and we don't do that. Um, but he said that program testing can use to be to show the presence of bugs, but you can never show the absence. And this is very true. Like uh, you can test, like unless you test the whole surface of your program, you will never be able to prove that through testing that your program is correct. And and testing the whole like every single possible input is usually impossible, except for very very simple stuff that is typically not very interesting. Um, 
And then when we go to distributed systems, like distributed systems is super hot. And, and, and I, will, I just want to give you two examples of how a distributed system can fail. So in these examples, assume that you have bugs, right? Without bugs, obviously, it wouldn't fail. Um, and, 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 and one of the surprisingly harder ones is distinguishing between a slow network and a dead machine. You cannot do anything. It's like if you have a friend and you send them a message, if they never reply, like eventually you have to assume they are dead or they don't want to be friends with you anymore, right? Or you're getting ghosted, whatever. And and so imagine you have these two machines and one machine is, is trying to send a message to this other machine, but because networks are weird and unreliable, this gets this packet gets lost in some time warp and, and it doesn't arrive there. And so the only thing we can we can do about this is that after a while, we just assume maybe this other machine is, is just not there anymore. Maybe it had a hardware fault or something. And so we mark it as down and we just assume that it doesn't participate anymore. However, this is typically not enough because what can happen that many seconds later, and, and, and the second is a very long time in, 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 in any system, right? Many seconds later, this message arrives. And if this machine now doesn't know that it's supposed to be dead, then it could continue to participate in, in some protocols, et cetera. Um, and therefore it could break stuff and then it can start fires and make people sad and, uh, and, and, and just generally like it, it, it won't be a good experience if your code doesn't handle this correctly. A more interesting one is message reordering. Like, let's say you are sending now two message uh, messages. And, and if you send two messages to another machine, we all know that we cannot expect that they will arrive in the same order. Um, but because we are humans, right, we write into our code send message A, then send message B. Now, if the receiver thinks that this ordering is part of the contract, bad stuff can happen, right? So we send the first message, the first message disappears. And then the second message immediately goes to the second machine. And then sometime later, the first message arrives. And now you have broken an implicit contract that was not true. And again, bad things will happen. Now, <clears throat> why is this such a hard problem? And, and it all boils down that a distributed system is not a pure function. So we have some randomness here. Like whenever you run on hardware, you have randomness. This is also true for disks, right? A disk can break, it can return wrong results, these kind of things. Uh, but the randomness in itself isn't that bad. Like debugging a randomized data structure isn't that hard. Like we can do that. But for distributed systems, this is somehow harder. And <clears throat> there are two other problems here. So one is failures are very rare. Like if you rely on message ordering, you will get away with that 99.99999% of the cases, right? So it will work fine in your testing environment, but then you go to production and you get unlucky and, and you lose your customer's data. And, and something like that can destroy your business. Um, and, but if you see it happening, you, you might see it only once in your lifetime, right? A specific failure. So you, you, you better get your tracing right from the beginning, because otherwise there's just no way you can figure out what just happened. Uh, you can also not debug it because changing timing will, will make differences here. And, and, and this boils down and here the difference between a normal like a, a random system like a, like a randomized binary tree um, and, and a distributed system is that we don't control the entropy right this randomness comes from the universe or from wherever but it doesn't come from us like we don't we don't control where these events are happening so how do we solve this uh, there are multiple ways you can you can try to work with that and foundation db has one and I, I i really like this solution and i have never seen anything 
better than that. If you did, then please let me know. I would be very interested in that. And so what we are doing is we do deterministic simulation. Um, and what that means is instead of having this external source of randomness, we want to control this randomness, right? So we, we, we want to make sure that we control when is a fault happening and, and that way we can also reproduce it as often as we want to. And there are three main ingredients to make this happen. Um, the first one is single threaded concurrency. Um, I, I did a lot of Googling before I prepared this talk to find a good def definition of concurrency. And the problem is it doesn't seem that people agree what that means. So for the purpose of this talk, we will use my understanding of concurrency and this will be by definition correct. And we'll just run with that and, 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 uh, maybe Andy needs to change his, uh, his um, exams or something. Um, then we have the second part is simulated implementation of all external communication, right? Because we cannot control randomness if we use a real network. And the third one is determinism. So I want to go through all three of them. So concurrency versus parallelism. So parallelism on a, on a very naive level just means that multiple things run at the same time. So a classical parallel program, which uses lock, blocking IO could look a bit like this. Like you have three threads of execution. Let's say this one makes some complex uh, calculations. And then after a while the kernel decides that it doesn't get any CPU time anymore. So it gets an interrupt and then after a millisecond or so, the, it gets scheduled again by the kernel and it continues to run. This guy might start reading from a disk so it gets, it gets blocked until the risk disk replies and continues. Or you can have network stuff, like whatever. And so what happens is that you consume some amount of CPU time on each of your threads of execution and you sleep in between. Um, Concurrency is more the term of breaking up your execution into small pieces and then you switch between them. Now you can do both. Like there are many systems that, that are highly concurrent and parallel, um, <clears throat> but FoundationDB does only single threaded concurrency. So what we do is whenever we have to um, do something that will take a long time and block like a disk read or, or, or a network or sending a network message. Instead of blocking the process, we will do an asynchronous call and we will immediately schedule another, um, another process uh, or we call them actor. Um, <clears throat> and so we do something like cooperative multitasking. If you're old enough like me, then you remember the times of like Windows 3.1 where you had cooperative multitasking and you only had one CPU, so you never had parallelism. Um, and then sometimes you would have one of these blue guys just hogging your CPU, never giving up control. And then you could start moving your mouse around which would then cause the kernel to interrupt and, and everything would start working again, which is why old people like me, if stuff gets slow, they automatically start moving the curls around and the younger people are like, are you crazy? This won't do anything. Um, <laughs> and so this is roughly what we do. And, and there are many ways of how you can implement this. And this is not any kind of like rocket science or something like many, many, a lot of software does this. However, we do it a bit in a special way. And the reason for that is so at the time where FoundationDB was implemented, there was no coroutines in the C++ standard. Right? So instead, what people typically still do in C++ for this is they use Boost SEO, which is a open source library that gives you event-based programming. Um, and so there, if you, if you want to do a system call or anything that would normally block your thread of execution, you would make your call and you would pass a callback. And then 
when your system call returns, there's some main loop that will call back into your call loop, uh, callback. And people often refer to that as a callback hell because this will not result in pretty code and it will not be very readable. I mean, you can make it kind of pretty, but it's, it's not a nice way of programming. And so, what, and so FoundationDB has its own programming language called Flow. And what that does is it, in, first of all, implements stackless coroutines. So these are basically still callbacks. Uh, and <clears throat> it adds a few keywords to, to C++, like active, wait, wait, next, etc. And if you're familiar with C Sharp, Python, JavaScript, I'm sure there are other languages that do that. They typically call this async await, right? You, you can mark a function as async, and then you can call them and just place a weight in front of them. And it will feel like you're doing blocking programming, but behind the scenes, the system, um, the system uses callbacks or maybe stackful coroutines to make all of this happen. And so this is implemented in a program called actor compiler that is part of the foundation DB code that takes one of these flow files and it just generates C++ code out of it. And then we compile this down to machine code. Uh, this is an example of how it looks like. This is a, a, an actor that we actually use. So you can mark your function with uh, the actor keyword. Like you cannot do this in normal C++, the compiler will yell at you. Um, a future something like, I don't wanna go too much into asynchronous programming, but it's basically just a result that hasn't happened yet. So you can wait on that. And the promise is something that you can send to another actor. It's, it, it, it's like, a, uh, it's not a stream, but it's, um, it's in a single assignment variable, something like that. Um, and so this code looks very readable, even though if you would do it with callbacks, it probably wouldn't. So we just call wait on this future. And this is a keyword. This is not a actual C++ function. Um, and <clears throat> it will basically call back in like, unless this, this future is ready, it will go back into the main loop and other stuff will happen. It will just register callback. And as soon as this future um, has a value, this gets woken up again. And then we will just iterate through all our promises and send this value to all the other promises. Um, and then at the end, like the reason we need this void type is because you cannot have a future void with a lowercase v. It's just like C++ is, um, it's how it is. So that's kind of an ugly hack that you can see here. Okay, so that's the easy part. So now we have a programming, was sorry. Flow, was Flow part of the original version of, of FoundationDB before Apple bought them or is this something you guys added after the fact? No, this is this has been there from day zero. I, I might actually even add that the simulator and including Flow has been written before Foundation DB. So the original company spent the first two years of its existence just writing a simulator. And then they had a simulator, so they started to write the database on top of that. Right. Okay. Um, so then the next part is simulated implementation of, of, of stuff in general, like with anything that could be non-deterministic. Um, so system calls in general are non-deterministic, right? Have you ever taken the time? Like that's a very simple example, like asking the system for the current time is not a deterministic thing. Um, and also behavior changes between kernel versions just to make this even harder. Um, and then also like network is the obvious example, sending a message or disk or whatever. Um, <clears throat> and, and so this is what happens often here, right? And what we have is we have these interfaces 
like i network i connection i async file which which are just pure abstract c++ classes that provide functionality for a network or for file system operations etc and because foundation db needs to run on mac os windows and linux you kind of have to go down this route anyways because this will look different on on every system and then you have an implementation for for each operating system for example this one here implements kernel aio um, and now you can just do the same in the simulator. So now when you want to send a packet from, from one actor to another, instead of sending it over the network, you just pretend that you're a network, but you actually just copy bytes from one memory region into another. So this is actually surprisingly simple. Like this code base is relatively small. And then the third ingredient, and this one is a bit trickier to get right, is determinism, right? We wanted that everything we do is deterministic. So what does that mean? When we start a simulation run, um, and a simulation run will just be some kind of workloads that we are running on, uh, on a foundation DB cluster, we, we start by generating a random number and that will be our input, that will be our seed. And we feed that to a deterministic random number generator. And so now whenever we make a decision about, for example, you send a network message, we typically don't just copy the memory. Instead, what we do is we will uh, introduce a small delay um, or we might even just close the connection because these things can happen. So we, we, we might introduce a failure. So we make a lot of random decisions and we, use, we will use this deterministic random number generator to make these decisions. And then at the end of the test run, we return the last random number as an output. So it's just like calling next on, on our deterministic random number generator. And if you get everything right, then two runs with the same input will generate the same output, right? Because you generate the same number of random numbers. And now you have a pure function, which is like really, really nice because you obviously also have a test description as input, but your test description plus your random seed will do the same thing though no matter how often you run it. And, and you can basically unit test this thing. And that is something you cannot do with any other database that I'm aware of. Um, and if you, now in theory, if you wanted to prove that at least your workload is kind of correct in, 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 in the context of your simulation, you could just test every single seed there is. But obviously that would require two to the power of 64 number of runs or something. Uh, so we are not going to do that, obviously. Um, <clears throat> so how do we achieve this determinism? Um, so we obviously, and, and, and how do we make use of this, right? There's obviously all the data that gets created. So we have trace files that are probably the most important ones for us to look at, but we also generate like disk queues and B3 files. Um, um, and, and I mean, it's, that's, that's almost it, right? And at the end of the, of the run, we can, go through our trace files and then make a decision whether the run is considered to be a success or not. And that is a, a hard problem in itself. Um, a simple example is if you inject too many failures, if you just say all my disks break, like then you're going to lose data, right? So it's not a very interesting test failure because we don't promise that we will survive um, an event where all your disks at the same time decide to give up. Um, and, but if you have, for example, an assertion failure, then we would consider this to be, to be a test failure and therefore it could point to, to a bug in the software. There are some difficulties 
So I talked about what does what makes a, a program non-deterministic. And there's a surprisingly large amount of things that will make your software non-deterministic. The most um, obvious one is if you call into a non-deterministic random number generator, right? If you, if you generate a true random number somewhere and then you do an if this modulo two um, equals zero, right? Then that will do something else every time you run it. Um, time is non-deterministic because you cannot rely on your on, on, on your clock to be to be deterministic or to, to, to run at a certain speed or whatever. Um, CPU cycles consume different lengths, right? Some CPU cycles are faster than others. Um, if you ask your uh, anything about your system state, right? Ask how much free disk space do I have? We don't have any control over that. This, this simulator might run on a notebook and, and, and someone might create a Word document and then after that, the disk space consumed will be different. Uh, the memory footprint, uh, like we rely on in certain parts on malloc and free and, and depending on the implementation, different things can happen. Um, obviously disk latencies, um, some like, uh, we don't control the file system and um, but also other things like if you ever read uninitialized memory um, anything can happen so if you read memory that you didn't initialize before then it has some it will have some random value in there and what we do to and 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 so even though everybody in the foundation DB team is trained to see these things in the code before they happen, we still get it wrong from time to time. And someone might introduce a memory bug or something that makes this non-deterministic. And what we do is we run roughly five percent of our tests. We run them twice with the same seed and compare the on seed at the end of the test. And that way, if someone um, introduces an non-determinism, we will eventually catch it. And, and then someone has to debug that. And, and debugging this is not a great experience. How, I mean, how often are these things even introduced? Is it like every commit or is it like every new feature? Like, how, like yeah, this, this sounds painful to debug. How often do you have to do it? These days, surprisingly, it's surprisingly rare that we see them. I would say every few months. So it's it's luckily a, a rare thing. And like, what, what what is typically the turnaround time to go? You know, st stomp the the, the non determinism weeks. Um, worst case, yes, we had that once. We once had a non-determinism that, that took a long time. In most cases, it boils down to running wall grind on it. Mm -hmm. um, and wall grind will catch that because most cases it's just a memory bug. Mm -hmm. um, but I remember one case where it took several weeks of debugging until we found the problem. Mm -hmm. Hey Marcus, can you explain what the unseat is? Yes. Um, so basic. So we have we have this deterministic random number generator. So what that does is it, it's basically just a pure function. Right? You 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 feed it a random number, and it will generate another number, and the output will look kind of random. Um, and and you can do that as often as you want to, and you always take your previous output as input again. Right? So you run into this loop, so you can generate as many random numbers as you want to. Um, <clears throat> now, if you call, like, let's say if you call this ten times and you start off with the same number, then the eleventh number will be the same in both cases, and that is basically our on seed. We assume that if our test is deterministic, we will generate the same number of random numbers, like the same amount of random numbers. So we will might generate 10,000, obviously it will be much more than 10. And so just after we finished our test, we will call our deterministic random number generator one more time. 
and that will be our own seed. So it will just be a, a, a another random number. And after and and so we can run the same test twice and compare this this last random number. And if everything goes well, they are the same. Thanks. Cool. So time. I, I quickly want to talk about time. That's a an interesting topic. So when you think of simulation, what we do is we simulate machines, we simulate a network, we simulate disks, we simulate data centers. So um, we don't, but we do all of that with only one CPU core. So that's one problem. The other problem is we cannot rely on the system time because as I said, it's non-deterministic. So we model time ourselves. And the way we do that is we, we start by assuming that um, each task, so if you think back of this picture that I showed you this with multiple colors of things that are, that are running one after the other, we assume that all of them take exactly zero seconds to complete. This is obviously not correct, but it's in many cases a good enough model as long as your IO bound. Um, <clears throat> and then whenever a task sleeps, we follow time. So the most trivial example is if you write some code that says something like wait and then sleep for one second, um, we will just have a, 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 a value in memory. It's, it's a double, right, in, in, in seconds. And we will just increment that by one. Um, and, and we sleep for multiple reasons. So when we do a network IO, as I said before, if, if you send something like you do your sends, but then in the background, we will, um, <clears throat> we will have another actor that basically just sleeps for a random amount of time. And, and then it, it delivers the, the network packets to, to the receiving actor. Uh, disk IO, kind of the same thing, like our simulated disk interface is just using blocking IO. Um, so we will write to the disk and it will kind of immediately return, but then we will sleep for some amount of time to, to simulate the actual disk latency. Um, and then also background tasks, there are like some like garbage collection stuff and a few other things that run like once every second or something like that. And so whenever we do that, we roll for time forward. And what that means, like one of the really nice properties of that is <clears throat> if you have a bug that causes your cluster to stop making progress, you can just continue forwarding time because as long as you don't, um, consume any, any CPU, you're just incrementing values on a double. So our timeouts is something like 36,000 seconds or something like that, or an hour, like I, I don't remember, it's roughly an hour until we time out. And this hour can go over in like milliseconds if, if everything is just waiting there. Um, <clears throat> And so for, for certain test scenarios, our simulations run actually much, much faster than, than, than real time does. For some other tests where we are more CPU bound, it, it might be slower. Um, but because we are injecting so many faults, um, it quite often happens that many machines are just waiting on timeouts and they cannot make progress because they first need to mark other machines as degraded and, and things like that. So there are also a few major limitations of testing like that. One that has bitten us pretty badly in the past is that engineers start to rely on that. Like, we have engineers who work in the way that they just write down some code. They run a hundred thousand tests. And they, if, if these tests succeed, they assume that their code is correct. And surprisingly, in most cases, this is the case. Like if you manage to get 
like all your tests succeeding, there's a pretty good chance that, that you have written something that is correct. Um, but that also means that some of the designs that you will find in FDB are not something, or something that only a madman would implement in any other system. Uh, can, you give, can you give an example? What do you, what do you mean by this? Yes, I can give you a great example. And, and luckily we caught that one in testing, but not in simulation testing, sadly. Um, so FoundationDB has its own metadata, right? Stuff like where are the shards written to, like which storage team is responsible for which data. Um, and if you lose this metadata, you're pretty much screwed because now you don't know where your data is. So you lose your cluster. It's very hard to recover from something like that. Um, <clears throat> and, and the way this works is very, very clever, but in my opinion, not in a good way clever. So we have special processes called proxies that are responsible to commit transactions. So a client will send a transaction to a proxy and the proxy will coordinate with uh, other processes to do conflict resolution and it, then it will write it to a distributed log um, after the commit. Um, but this metadata is not in the storage servers. Instead, each proxy will have a copy of all the metadata in memory. Um, and additionally, we write it into a distributed transaction log. The way this is implemented is when you commit something, the first proxy will write, will write this into an in-memory key value store, which will have a disk queue as its, as its durable storage. Um, <clears throat> and then it will send it to all the other proxies and the other proxies will also write it into an in-memory store with a uh, disk queue as a, a durable storage. But this disk queue is shared by all of them. So what we do to get around this is we rely on determinism. So we say only the committing proxy will actually write it to the disk and all the other proxies will create all the disk writes, but before they write, they will just decide to throw them away. So now if all of them do exactly the same thing in the same order, then this is working great, right? But if one of them decides, like does something non-deterministic in any way, then they have a different idea how the disk queue could look like. And so initially nothing bad will happen, but as you continue and you continue writing, they will start to overwrite that stuff and they will do it in a, in, in, in a very non-graceful way, non, like in a very bad way. So they, they will overwrite by like, a, like they, they will have a wrong offset, for example. And then eventually something in your system crashes, you need to recover and you need to read your disk view again, but at this time it's not readable anymore. And so you have lost your whole state. And there was a bug with that um, where we didn't, where like basically one proxy did not commit something, but everybody else thought that it would be committed. And now instead of just corrupting this part of the data, it would make the whole metadata unreadable. And as soon as this happened, the cluster was basically gone. Like we couldn't, we couldn't recover from that ever. Um, <clears throat> and, and you can break it in other surprising stuff. You can just break it by making, for example, snapshotting in the in-memory key value store non-deterministic, which is not an unreasonable thing to do, right? And, and if you're not ex like familiar enough with foundation DB, you might do that and then be surprised that that stuff fails like in a really bad way. So that's one of the more complicated examples. Um, and I think it's a, it's a very clever solution, um, but it's not a good solution probably. Something more naive would probably work better. Um, I know this was a complex example. I'm sorry about that. Maybe I should have thought about a better one first. No, it was good. It, it, made, it made sense. It was good, thank you. Okay, good. Um, Another problem is we find more, oh, that's a typo. This should mean we find more bugs the longer we test, right? 
Um, so the, we are running hundreds of thousands of tests per day, probably in the millions. Apple is doing the same thing. Um, but sometimes someone introduces a bug that is extremely subtle. So you need 200,000 tests to find, a, to find this bug in the first place. So now it's very hard to keep your to keep your main branch clean, right? Because you can run twenty thousand tests before you commit, no problem. But that might not actually find that bug. So after a while, you end up with something that has just like three failures out of five hundred thousand runs. And now the question is, who's going to debug this? And it probably won't be the person who who introduced the bug because we have no idea who that was. Um, and so far, the solution to that is we have a few people who are very, very good at debugging this, and they will then just like once a month or so, they will sit down for two days and find these very raw failures and then fix them. Um, do, do they want this, to do this, or is it like picking the short straw? Like, like how do you guys do that? <laughs> We currently, it's it's mostly one person who's extremely good at doing this, um, and this person works for Apple, so I have been happy to just give him these things. Um, but now we, since very recently, we have a rotation, and so we just have the most, all the most senior people in the team are in the rotation, and so you will like once a week, you will have to spend a day debugging these kind of failures. Um, there's a, obviously a risk that we that our models are wrong, right? You can have certain failures in systems, and if you don't simulate them, then you will be surprised when they happen in, in production. Uh, um, one example could be there's a very rare bug in certain disks that when you write something, the disk will acknowledge the write but not do anything at all. And, and if something like that happens, you're in a pretty tough spot to detect that because all your checksums will still be correct, but you will end up in, a, in kind of a weird situation where like storage copies have, like three storages will have different copies of the same data. Um, we also have chaos testing, obviously. So we have real clusters that inject failures, but they kind of have the same problem. So sadly, this one here means we are finding sometimes problems in, in productions. And, Luckily, they always were problems that cause availability loss and never any data corruption or anything like that. Um, then, oh, I guess my camera is overheating. <laughs> okay. You're back. Um, You're back. You're back. I, I'm back for now. Um, and then another thing is the simulator assumes that the CPU is infinitely fast. So we do. Um, uh, and that is obviously not true. And this is typically okay as long as we are IO bound, but once in a while someone introduces code that, that, that isn't running in constant time. And this can cause weird problems. So if, because everything runs in a th single thread, if you are hogging the CPU for two seconds, for example, then other machines will assume that you're dead because you stop like heart beating, all these kind of things. Typically, they will not cause any major issues um, because it will like we test very well for like stuff not responding quickly. Uh, but it can make a system unstable if you catch it, catch it in production. And, and we have certain things that we do to catch those. Uh, so whenever we run a task, we count CPU cycles. And if we go above a certain threshold, we write a trace line and says, this is a slow task. Maybe you should look at that and whether something happens. And obviously, you can get them just because of a context switch in the operating system. But if you see a certain task being slow very often, even in simulation, then you probably should look at it. And the last one, which is a really hard one, are gray failures. So because of the strong consistency guarantees, we don't, we don't guarantee progress, right? If, if the whole network goes down, obviously, but what are we going to do, right? We don't, we don't make progress. 
Um, and so most of our tests inject certain kind of failures and then at the end they, they just verify that everything is, is being able to come back up and everything is like all the data is still in a consistent state and nothing bad happens in between. But we can run into real networking issues uh, where, for example, the leader, like we have one leader process that coordinates a lot of stuff that gets elected through some Pexos-like algorithm. Um, the, we saw a box where this, or not box, but problems where this leader would get um, elected on a machine that couldn't talk to any other machines except for the ones that are responsible for election. Or we could have problems where a single disk being extremely slow, but sadly not dead, would cause the whole system to slow down. And these are obvious problems that we need to fix because we want to have as much availability as possible, but simulation is not a great way of finding these. And so we use chaos testing for these kind of things. So very quickly, this is how this will then look like. So we have one single machine and this single machine runs everything Right. It runs a client, like it runs all the clients, it runs all the servers, it has simulated disks, simulated machines, simulated data center, simulated everything. And this allows us to quickly inject failures. Um, I quickly want to show how one test looks like. So we have workloads that are compiled into the binary. I'm not sure whether you can read this. It's, it's a bit small. Um, I can see it. OK. okay. But these workloads, so for example, this is a workload that runs on the client and each client will execute the transactional workload. And what they do is basically the, the data forms a circle. So where each value is the key for another key value pair. And, and if you walk all of them, then you should walk in a circle, which is something that is pretty easy to verify as long as nobody writes to the database. So at the end of the test run, we can verify that we still have a circle. And if we don't, then it typically means that something in the transaction subsystem is broken. Um, and then we have a workload that introduces clogging. So it introduces random network partitions between random nodes. Um, rollback basically just forces um, the situation where you commit something and then this commit gets rolled back because of a failure. And now if that happens, storages might need to forget about this commit. Um, so this has to be tested. And attrition is going to just kill machines, right? So this says kill up to 10 machines, but make sure that you don't kill, that you have at least three that survive, because if you kill all of them, right, you, you, you just get unavailable or lose data or whatever, and then also like bring them back. So we reboot them in this particular case. Um, and, and this is one of the simpler tests that I found. But the, the, the benefit here is because we have these workloads, we can combine them as we want to. So this is kind of a test description and all of them run in parallel. You can also define to have certain ones that run in succession to each other. Um, there are other disasters that we simulate. Um, sometimes it's baked in into the simulator and it does it all the time. Sometimes it's instructed through a workload. Um, like, as I said, broken disks, broken machines, clogging, um, nukes, like this, like processes that just lose all their data at once. Um, DOM system administrators. So we try to break our configuration and make sure that, that, that we don't lose data. Right? So if you change the configuration to something that is invalid, then you might run into a situation where the cluster becomes unavailable. But then if you fix your configuration, it should come back up and be happy. Um, and <clears throat> not all of them obviously are fixed. So we, we know of, self, like of, of luckily other companies that, that manage to configure the cluster in a way that would, that would break. Um, this one is incredibly hard to like, basically 
system administrators are more creative when it comes to breaking stuff than we were. And, and in that case, we, we have, yeah, we, we might need to fix it. Um, also in every simulation test, because everything runs in one process, we have a global view of our data. So we can verify that if we ever acknowledge a transaction back, we can verify that it never gets rolled back. Um, we will always, at the end of the test, remove all the loads and make sure that the cluster quiets down so that it doesn't run like some workloads, uh, some phantom workload in the end. And very quick, we are actually out of time. Uh, I, I mentioned this before. We have a Kubernetes cluster that, that runs these tests for um, like hundred thousands of time, like hundred thousands of those. Uh, why do I have this again? I don't know. Um, there's some future work we try to use our CPU time more efficiently. For this, we try to identify tests that are better at finding bugs than others and run them more often. Um, this might be a machine learning problem, or it might just be very simple statistics. Although these days it seems that statistics and machine learning is the same thing. I don't know. I'm, I'm a bit old for that. Um, we want to find blind spots better. So that might be have a specific team that only works on simulation testing and doesn't communicate directly with the engineers. Um, we have some ideas how we can achieve this. And the last one, and I want to finish with that is it, like one of our founders, when we found this, this horrible bug that I quickly mentioned before, what he told me was it's always easy to blame testing or code review whenever something goes horribly wrong. But a properly architected system will not, into, not run into catastrophic failures, even if there's a bug. And, and there's, a, there's a truth to that, right? If, if, if your architecture is very robust, then even, on the, even if something misbehaves horribly in an unexpected way, you might survive with a with a blue eye, a black eye, or something, and 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 so these are co like called Byzantine failures in some regard, and and we can make certain things more robust against these kind of these kind of failures, and <clears throat> that's it. I, I'm sorry of okay. running too late. No, but I, I still here for questions if you have any. Absolutely, so I'll, I'll clap on behalf of everyone else. I'll just say, um, um, Marcus, I think next time don't go cheap on the camera. I think you should have got one that doesn't overheat. <laughs> yes. Uh, and I've never heard a camera overheating. I, 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 it's, I'm assuming it's not just a webcam, right? It's, it's a bit more complicated. It's a mirrorless camera, yeah. Got it. It, it's the, the sensor is pretty large and because of that it can overheat. Got it, okay. All right, uh, again, we'll open the floor. Does anybody have any, any questions for uh, Marcus? Hi, I, I'm Chad. I'm from uh, CMU. Th thanks for the cool talk. It's, this is very neat stuff. Um, just to confirm what I think I saw is the infrastructure for doing this type of testing part of the open source foundation DB. It looks like it's in the uh, test slash slow. I saw the uh, clog test in TOML files. Yes and no. So sadly, not everything. Is, like the simulator is open source, right? So you can download FD, like check out this source code and you can run a simulation test on your MacBook. The infrastructure part, which we call Joshua, which runs, um, which sets up a cluster for you and, and then is able to run like a million of these tests because you don't want to run a million tests on your notebook. Like you can, but it will take a very long time. Um, that part is not open sourced yet. I was, and we don't own it, like Apple is owning it and we, we have access to it through a source code kind of agreement. Um, but the plan is to get this open sourced. Okay, uh, this is a question from someone on chat. Uh, it's, it's late where they are, they are, so they can't unmute themselves. They ask, what if there's another, what if there is, what if there is another actor-based model based database which is written in C, then how hard would it be to port float to C from C++? Uh, 
It basically is asking if there's already there's already existing database that's actor based on the actor model, but it's written in C. Would it be a major rewrite to to introduce Flow and then you know make make it work in C? Um. I mean, yes, we rely a lot on C++ functionality. So it would mean that we would have to rewrite the whole code base, basically. Okay. All right, Wayne, go ahead. Hi, I'm Wayne. Uh, I'm one of the Andy's PhD students. Uh, I was going to ask, have you looked at Mozilla's like, RR before? It seems to share a lot of principles for like, if you control the randomness, then you can make get deterministic. And it will also have some functionality that like, uh, maybe I didn't catch it that like, it could do chaos mode scheduling where some threads have higher priority, some threads, some threads have lower priority. Yeah, I'm just curious to see if you like have explored Mozilla RR. So are uh, you mean the, the, the Mozilla thing? Yeah, the Mar reverse debugger, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, we did. Um, so we found that RR is, much slower and more memory intensive than, than our simulator. Um, so if you if a simulation run consumes eight gigabytes of memory, then it probably won't run on my notebook in our like kind of a like that that's probably the, the major drawback here, like just the speed. Uh, but People have used it. Um, they have run the simulator in there, but we have never run an actual cluster within RR. So I don't know how well that would work. So I cannot really comment on that. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, I, think, I think we're over time. So we'll, we'll, we'll stop here. Again, Marcus, thank you so much for spending time with us. And this has been super insightful. This, this is, I think I agree with you. I've never heard anybody do, doing sort of the, the kind of stuff you're doing in, in foundation for testing. So this is super exciting.